tüketici elektroniği, otomobiller, tıbbi cihazlar, uçaklar, akıllı cihazlar, giyilebilir cihazlar, ortak bileşenleri mi? Çipler. You don't buy them directly, but trust me, you need them. So when the silicon chips are down, what happens? Well, we're finding out. Otomobil sektörü dünyanın dört bir yanındaki otomobil şirketlerinin üretimde frene basmasıyla sert bir darbe aldı. Sadece onlar değil, makine ve tanınmış elektronik cihaz üreticileri de bunu hissediyor. Çip açığı mevcut uluslararası ilişkiler sorunlarını da besliyor. Ve gelecekteki kullanımlarla bağlantılı talep gerçekten yavaşlayacakmış gibi görünmüyor. Okay, so maybe that last bit is a bit tangential, but you get the picture. The chip shortage could be why you're having a hard time finding a PS5 or a Volkswagen Passat. Yılda yaklaşık 1 trilyon çip üretiliyor. Yani dünyadaki her insan için yaklaşık 128 adet. Suffice to say, the world runs on chips slash semiconductors. So why are we coming up short? The pandemic changed consumer behaviors. We're buying personal computers, new phones, new tablets, um, Xboxes, so we can work from home and to cope with the lockdowns. And companies are upgrading their digital infrastructure to enable remote working. And all these purchases are driving up the demand for chips. At the beginning of the pandemic, we have estimated an economic downturn. Industries such as the automakers, they slashed their chip purchases. And, but the economy in East Asia bounced back sooner than expected with more demands for cars. Car makers keep limited inventories. So right now they are buying, buying, buying. As the coronavirus crisis reshapes supply and demand, chip companies are scrambling. And if there's an industry that can't simply quickly ramp up production or ask its clients to do without its products for a while or shift its manufacturing elsewhere rapidly, it's the chip industry. Supply chains have been spread across countries as the cost of communication has gone down along with, you know, the cost of transportation. So this was largely seen as a good thing to spread the production of semiconductors and other high tech components across countries, you know, kind of based on some sort of fundamental theories of economics and that um, by doing so, you could reduce the cost of production, thereby increasing efficiency. But in the past several years, as concerns over technology and, you know, technological sovereignty have grown, Um, this has been coming to be viewed as a geopolitical risk rather than, you know, economic benefit. Hold that thought. Geopolitical complexity is going to figure in this. So let's run through the basics. One, every country in the world needs chips. Two, chips are complicated to produce. And three, because the world economy runs on chips, who makes them and who is able to buy them, goes a long way towards defining who stagnates and who progresses. One expert likens it to one other commodity that's seen its own share of geopolitical contentiousness. Or let's put it this way, they are, as they've been called, the new oil in the, in the digital age. Everything from your phone to your air conditioning and, and everything in between, of course, uses chips. And of course, as technology becomes more central, chips become more important. And most importantly, the ability to manufacture smaller and smaller chips that can do more is uh, is absolutely critical. Daha fazlasını yapabilecek daha küçük çiplerden bahsetmişken sizi onunla tanıştırmak iyi olacak. Gordon Moore, Amerikan çip şampiyonu Intel'in kurucu ortağı, 1965'te bir çipe sığabilen, çiplerin aktif bileşeni olan transistör sayısının her iki yılda bir ikiye katlanacağını söyledi. Anlamı, maliyetler yarı yarıya azaldıkça bilgisayarların verimliliklerini ikiye katlaması beklenebilir. Gerçek bir yasa olmasa da bir tür yol gösterici bir ilke. Increasing power but decreasing size. You've probably felt that happening. That's how we went from this. To this. Yeni nesil süper hızlı 5G bağlantısı daha yaygın hale geldikçe, internet genişlemeye devam ettikçe ve yapay zeka destekli teknoloji geliştikçe, çeşitli türlerde daha güçlü çiplere olan iştah da buna göre artacaktır. Çipler ne kadar güçlü olursa üretimi o kadar özel hale gelir ve bunu yapabilen üretici sayısı o kadar az olur. İşte 3 büyük çip üreticisi. Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nden Intel, Güney Kore'den Samsung ve Tayvan'dan TSMC sektörün önde gelen şirketleri olarak kabul ediliyorlar. 
yani dünyanın en gelişmiş çiplerini yapabilecekleri anlamına geliyor. They're not the same kinds of companies. Samsung and Intel are what you would call integrated device manufacturers, meaning they can design, manufacture and sell the chips from start to finish. TSMC is what you would call a foundry, meaning they make chips for companies without factories themselves, or fabs, as they're known in industry parlance. Bu arada bu elektronik ürün üreten fabrikalar her nesil çiple daha pahalı hale geliyor. McKinsey danışmanlık firmasına göre 5 nanometre üretim hattına sahip bir tesis kurmanın maliyeti en az 5,4 milyar dolar. Bu 5 nanometrelik çipin bir örneği A14 Bionic. Apple bunun bir akıllı telefondaki en hızlı çip olduğunu söylüyor ve iPhone 12'de bulunuyor. Bu çipler TSMC tarafından üretildi. Tüketiciler için Apple kadar bilinen bir isim olmayabilir ancak Apple TSMC olmadan yapamazdı. Ne de Çinli teknoloji devi Huawei gibi Apple'ın rakipleri de. Now TSMC and its home country Taiwan is in a unique position. This is all part of the geopolitical complexity we were talking about earlier. So here you have this hugely important industry located in Taiwan and Taiwan of course is you know right in the center of this of geopolitical struggle. The Communist Party now make no qualms about saying that Taiwan is an inevitable part of China that is only waiting for reunification. They whether they have they don't have a publicly stated timetable per se, but they make no qualms about it. They have not renounced violence to reunify the country as they see it. And so Taiwan, you could certainly be see it as being a very real flashpoint. Really, whether or not China successfully invaded Taiwan, it is like almost guaranteed that the semiconductor industry and you know the global supply chains would be disrupted by this. There's also some concerns that if successful, that China would take over Taiwan's manufacturing industry uh, or the semiconductor industry. And because of Taiwan's critical role in the manufacture of these chips, that could be relatively problematic for the companies that use TSMC in Taiwan. So there's some discussions that if China did take over TSMC, that China could put uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party on the board or you know, exert other influence through other ways. Chips being as important as they are, they figure prominently in the often intertwined discussion of security and technological advancement. Just think of the US coming up with its special kind of list. An entity list that places companies and persons for, the, for behaviors contrary to US national security interests and foreign policy interests. So let's say human rights violation will count for one, um, IP theft will be another one. And one notable company you may have heard is the Chinese telecom giant Huawei. In the summer of 2020, the US also places list of Chinese and Russian military end users to the entity list. So China's SMIC, the short for Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, also made it onto the list because of its ties with the PLA. By this point, US mid chips are essentially off limits to China. Incidentally, this also contributed to the massive chip shortage we were talking about earlier. When SMIC got blacklisted by the US, that meant it couldn't purchase advanced manufacturing gear from the United States. So the sanctions prompted some of SMIC's chip buyers to shift their orders to TSMC, thereby helping to create a bottleneck. Çin ayrıca ABD yaptırımlarını atlatmak için başka yerlerden çip stokluyordu. Artık teknolojide dünya lideri olma hırsları iyice yerleşmiş durumda ve yarı iletkenler bunun önemli bir parçası. Kısıtlamalar bu plan için bir tehdit. Ancak Çin kendi stratejisini oluşturuyor. So China has worked for several decades to develop its semiconductor industry. It has poured money into this, but really the past several years, this drive has been accelerated as China's vulnerabilities in semiconductors has been made so clear by US sanctions. We see this by companies like Huawei pouring money into Chinese startups um, and other semiconductor companies across the industrial value chain. But it really remains seen whether or not China will, and you know the Chinese companies will be successful at doing this. So they're starting from, a, from certainly a, a, a backward position 
and then they've got a lot of ground to make up. And they also are now entering a phase, a, a phase where there simply isn't the trust that is there. Ch chip design relies on a whole slew of components and inputs from global chains of engineers and companies. And that's a, a chain of trust, which China is simply outside at the moment. So it's going to be very difficult to simply say, in five years, we're going to have leading chip design companies. You can look across a number of industries in China, whether it be you know, high tech industries, difficult industries like airline, commercial airlines. China has been trying to do that for 30 years with very little success. For the size of its economy, it may demand great things. It may put them in the plan. There may be political imperatives, but it takes a lot of work to get there. And there is no certainty they're going to get there from where they are today. So once again, in broad strokes, the US and China both want to be the tech superpower. The US has accused China, among other things, of intellectual property theft and of human rights violations and has blocked certain Chinese companies from accessing US technology. China is spending billions in order to be able to decrease its dependence on tech imports, thereby also reducing its vulnerability to sanctions put in place in part to punish aggression and deter future belligerence, like say towards Taiwan. And that's why chips are the new economic security and geopolitical flashpoint. The question is, what should be done? I think much of the, well, the ideas behind some of the US policy were correct. I think the implementation was poor and certainly the global coordination was poor. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. And again, how do we use these, whether it is sanctions or how do we use this leverage in a positive way to actually get better outcomes? It is, and I think that's what's been missing in much of the US policy. A successful policy needs to balance the business interests and also national security concerns. And an ideal approach will be plurilateral with like-minded countries instituting similar policies at the same time. As it so often is, the answer is working together. Whatever global challenge is coming up, be it the next pandemic, climate change, food security, technology and therefore chips are going to play an outsized role. Güvenilir bir tedarik sağlamak tüm ülkelerin çıkarına, ARGE'ye ve eve daha yakın üretime yatırım yapmak, daha fazla ve çeşitli tedarikçilere sahip olmak ve tedarik zincirlerini kısaltmak çok önemli. Yarı iletkenler bir politik duyarlılık kaynağı olsa da aynı zamanda birbirine bağlı, birbirine bağımlı bir küresel ekonominin de bir hatırlatıcısıdır. Dolayısıyla çipler azaldığında dünya ülkeleri için bunu nasıl geri alabileceklerini düşünmek adına iyi bir zaman. Tercihen işbirliği içinde.